This episode of Lawyers Tell All is brought to you by the Intake Academy. Are you ready to convert more callers to qualified cases, rapidly qualify good cases, and transform unqualified prospects to advocates for your firm, whether you're able to handle their case or not? Visit www.intakeacademy.com and discover how to cement relationships with more of your ideal clients. Get them to commit to you and send you more referrals than you ever thought possible. Welcome to the Lawyers Tell All podcast, where Chris Mullins, the preeminent sales and communications consultant in the legal industry, shows you how it looks through lawyers' eyes. Here, innovators in the trenches provide powerful insights that help you connect with new clients, handle the sometimes harsh realities of the legal profession, and embrace the mindsets needed to succeed. Be sure to visit our website at www.lawyerstellall.com. And while you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, lean in, tune in, and let's take a deep dive. It's Chris Mullins with Lawyers Tell All, and today I'm going to interview Leah Wise, and Leah is going to introduce herself to you. Go ahead, Leah. Hi, everybody. My name is Leah Wise. I am a personal injury attorney based in Texas. Um, I'm from the Texas-Mexico border, so basically if you go any more south um, from where I live, you're going to be in Mexico. Um, I really love, you know, the culture, being back home um, and being on the Texas-Mexico border. Um, I'm 33 years old. I have been practicing law for seven years in November. It'll be seven years. And um, I am very passionate about helping my clients. And um, I do a lot of different things other than law. So um I have a lot of different hobbies. And so I love that there's more to me than just being a lawyer. Yeah. And so, okay. What, what are some of the hobbies that you like? So um, I actually, I actually own four companies. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I have a clothing line. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called Crash Gal Couture. Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm very big into fashion. I love fashion. I love beauty. I love jewelry, anything girly. So uh, my, my sort of creative outlet is, uh, my clothing line. And so every other Tuesday we drop new, um, styles, new clothes. You can check out our website. It's crashgalcouture.com. Yeah. And, um, so just a little side note here in my law firm, my alter ego name is Crash Gal because I do a lot of car accidents. That's not all I do, but um, I do handle a lot of car accidents. And so my name within the legal community and on the billboards that we have here uh, is Crash Gal. So I took that to my clothing line and the name of my clothing line is Crash Gal Couture. Mm -hmm. Other than the law firm um, and my clothing line, I also own a real estate investing company called um, Leo Wise Enterprises. And so um, I invest in different um, commercial real estate. I have tenants and um, I actually just bought a former strip club here in where I where I live. And um, I am trans currently transforming that building into um a co-work a co-working space oh okay so I've heard of like we work or yeah. co-working other co-working spaces i'm transforming that building into a co-working space on the first floor and then on the second floor is going to be my law office um and then i just started a nonprofit corporation it's called wise women foundation because one of my biggest passions is helping women especially women of color minority women Mm-hmm. Um, and so we just got our IRS tax exemption status. So we're ready to hit the ground running with that and, um, you know, support like women centered causes. Okay. So, uh, how does all of, everything that you just said connect to your, your law firm, like being a lawyer, like how did that, how did that all sync up? Yeah. So the, the law firm came first, okay. uh, that was the first, you know, business venture that I started. And then, um, you know, I was tired of paying rent 
for my mm-hmm. office. And I was like, you know what? Like I need to buy my own office. Right. So there that sparked my interest in real estate. And I ended up buying the office that I'm in now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I realized, okay, like, you know, I have the hang of, you know, real estate. I'm going to keep buying more real estate mm-hmm. and, um, you know, in making, turning it into like investment opportunities. Mm-hmm. So that's how my, um, invest my real estate investment company started. Right. And, uh, and so being a lawyer is a very serious job as, you know, most people know it's, you know, people don't come to lawyers because everything is going well in their life. They usually come to us because there's some sort of problem or issue that they need help with. Mm-hmm. And so I felt like, you know, I do need some sort of creative outlet. Um, I do need something that I, uh, you know, to have fun with. And so I've always loved clothes. Like I mentioned earlier, I love styling outfits. I love fashion. Um, Mm -hmm. You can check out, you know, my personal Instagram. It's at crash gal. Mm -hmm. Um, And you'll be able to tell that I'm into anything girly clothes, shoes, everything. I know right now I'm, I'm wearing like a plain black (laughs) uh, shirt, a blouse, but um, you know, it's rare. I actually wear a color almost every day. I love playing with all sorts of colors. So that's how the clothing line came about. And then throughout my time as an attorney, I have met so many different people, so many different clients, and um, I just became really passionate about helping people. And Mm -hmm. so that's why I decided to start the nonprofit foundation, because I'm very passionate about like women's issues and helping women, you know, as a Latina attorney, um, you know, I know that there are a lot of barriers Mm -hmm. to women of color. Um, you know, reaching their goals. And so my, one of my biggest passions is helping women of color. So give me an example of how you do that. Like how you're helping women of color, just, just a couple of examples. Yeah. So um, last year we decided to help out a cause that's really prevalent here where I'm from on the, on the Texas, Mexico border. And that is called period poverty. Have you heard of period poverty? Okay, so period poverty is a global crisis in which women, you know, school age girls, uh, you know, women who work um, cannot afford feminine hygiene products. Okay, all around the world, young girls are missing school because they don't have access to feminine hygiene products. Right. You would think that in the U.S. nobody struggles with that. But a lot of women, a lot of young girls do. Mm -hmm. So. Um, part of what we have been doing is trying to, um, spread awareness about period poverty. Cause a lot of people think that it's not even an issue in the U S right. Um, and so what we did is we raised, um, money and, um, we donated over $4,000 worth of feminine hygiene products to low income high schools, um, in the area that I live. And so that was spearheaded hundred percent by my law firm. Uh, another thing that we do is, um, I have, you know, mentorship groups of, um, you know, young girls who are aspiring lawyers. And so, you know, I try to mentor them and, you know, explain to them, you know, about the LSAT because a lot of, for me, for example, I didn't know any women lawyers growing up. Like I, I just didn't know any at all. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, much less a lawyer who looked like me, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important for other young women, you know, Latina women and black women to see that there are minority women who can be successful lawyers, who can be successful business owners. And so I take, you know, mentorship very seriously. Um, And, and so that's another, another example of, you know, Mm -hmm. what we are trying to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, we just, we're very passionate about helping our community because we do feel that like as successful business owners, we have a duty to give back because if it weren't for our community, we wouldn't be successful business owners. So we're always looking for ways to give back to the community. Um, You know, we've raised, so actually just a few weeks ago, we raised over $15,000 for survivors of domestic violence. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's another women-centered issue, although it's not specific to women only, Mm -hmm. 
majority of, of domestic violence survivors are women. So yeah, that's just a little, you know, nutshell of what we do. That's, that's wonderful. So why did you become a lawyer? So that's a great question. I became a lawyer because after I graduated from college, I took a job working for a state senator um, here in, well, not here in Austin, but in Austin, Texas, where I was living at the time. That's where I went to school. And um, I saw the way that legislators are able to advocate for their constituents, right? And I wanted, I thought, okay, how can I do this for my community without having to run for office, right? <laughs> I have no desire to run for office, yeah. but I do want to be an advocate, right? So I decided that, you know, law school was the best way for me to do that because lawyers, what they do is they're, they're advocates. We're all advocates, advocates mm -hmm. for our clients just mm -hmm. in the courtroom, not, not in the state capital, right? And so that's why I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. It was to be an advocate for my clients. So, but before all that happened, what else was on your mind? Like before that stage of your life, what else was on your mind of, was a designer? Like what were the different things? No, no, I, there was a lot of different things that I was considering doing. Um, I, a, a part of me wanted to go into journalism because um, my undergrad communicate, my undergrad uh, degrees in communication studies um, with a concentration in political communication. But a lot of my friends in the communication school were journalism majors. And um, I'm a very, a uh, inquisitive person. I love the idea of like investigative journalism or just journalism yeah. in general. And so I actually wrote for the college newspaper. I went to the University of Texas at Austin and I was a news reporter for the Daily Texan. Um, mm -hmm. I really loved that. So journalism was something that I was thinking about doing. Um, like I said, I was working for a state senator at the time. And the reason why I started working for that state senator is because I had been interning at a political action committee called Annie's List. And Annie's List, um, their mission is to elect progressive women to, uh, you know, the Texas legislature. And so um, I was very, you know, passionate. I've always been passionate about women's issues. And so I yeah. thought, okay, maybe I'll go into politics and I'll, you know, be, you know, work at the at the Capitol for, you know, state representatives or senators and, you know, affect change that way. Um, but then I decided, you know what, I don't want to work for anybody. I want to work for myself. And but I also want to give back to the community. So that's why I decided to go to law school. OK, that's that's interesting. So let me ask you this. Um, how did your parents influence you? Um, my parents are super supportive, super helpful. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they were kind of like open to me doing whatever it is I was passionate about. Mm -hmm. My dad had mentioned to me a few times, like, hey, I think you'd make a good lawyer. Um, and so that kind of like stuck in the back of my head. Um, but, you know, I still wasn't sh I I really don't like school. I really don't like school. <laughs> I thought going to law school <laughs> for yeah. three years kind of discouraged me about going to law discouraged me from going to law school, but, you know, I decided, okay, it's three years. It's a very small amount of time yeah. you know, in the grand scheme of your life. Right? right. And so, um, my, my, my mom is super supportive. She would have supported anything I decided to do. Um, my dad is, you know, the same way they're, they're really, really like emotionally supportive people. Mm. Right. Um, you know, although they could not support me a hundred percent financially, right, yeah. um, but like, you know, anything else was like, whatever you need, however we can help you. However, you know, they always believed in me so much more than I believed in myself. So, um, my dad, when I decided to go to law school, my dad was like, I just know you're going to be such a successful attorney and you're going to have <laughs> hundreds of clients and you're going to be turning away clients. And in oh, my yeah. <laughs> dad, <laughs> I know, right. Dads, I mean, parents always think that about their kids. And in my head, I was like, mm, I don't know if that's going to happen. You know, I had all these <laughs> outs and insecurities and then, you know, fast forward seven years later and he was absolutely correct. We have hundreds of clients. We turn away clients. Um, you know, we're a multi-million dollar revenue law firm. Yeah. And so my parents could see that before yeah. I could. So um, they're just I mean, amazing, amazing parents. 
That's wonderful. So what about your mom? Was it your mom that um, helped with the influence of women in, you know, fighting for women, women issues, being strong for women? Yeah. Um, my mom is, a, she was a teacher for over 30 years. And so, um, you know, she was, she's a very strong woman. She's very like, very motherly, very maternal, um, just such a sweet, sweet person. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she really inspired me to be, um, a empathetic person, a sympathetic person, a, you know, person who never sees themselves as better than anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, and so she really inspired me to be, um, just like a, a relatable down to earth person and yeah. you know, her career as, as a teacher, um, she's retired now and now oh. she works for me a little bit. Oh, she, there's no way that's awesome. Yeah. Now she kind of works. Yeah. She kind of works. Is your mom for, there right now? Is she there? No, she's not. Oh, she's oh, not. No, darn. Yeah. She's, yeah, she's, a, she's part-time one of my employees. <laughs> So yeah, she, she's definitely, you know, inspired me. She was the oldest of five children raised by a single mom. Um, my mom had to grow up very fast and she had got her first job at 14 years old. It wasn't even, you know, legal, a legal job. Um, mm -hmm. She was getting paid under the table by a bakery um, because, you know, back then, I mean, well, you had to be 16 to work, but, you know, my mom had to work. And so she wow. got paid, you know, by a bakery owner to sell uh, what's called pan dulce um, here in the RGV. And so she's been a hard worker her whole life, her whole, whole life. And so that's very inspiring to me. You know, somebody like my mom, very low income. I mean, she grew up in government housing to, to make it as far as she did. So was it, um, so what was it that guided you to the path of um, fighting for women, helping women, focusing on women? Um, you know, I think it's just sort of inherent in me. I've always, I have like a very like, um, I don't want to say a strong personality, but I have, you know, a lot of opinions and, um, you know, very strong willed. And so I just from a young age, it was like, well, cause I have one older brother, right. It's just me and my brother. And, um, anytime there was like, gender norms that were imposed on us I was always like well why you know I just questioned right. things from yeah. a very very uh, young age like if I have to wash dishes he has to wash dishes too you know what I mean and so I was yeah. just very aware of like gender norms and like especially in the Latino community um you know there's a lot of expectations of women to be uh -huh you know, sort of submissive, um, you know, not so ambitious, you know, taking care of the family, making sure the home is taken care mm -hmm. of. And that didn't really jive well with me from a very, very young age. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I can't really, I, I can't really pinpoint what it is that made me so passionate about women's issues. I think it's probably a mixture of where I grew up and my culture and the fact that I didn't want to um, conform to oh. what the Latino community thinks women should be like. Right. And a lot of that has changed. You know, I live in a predominantly Latino community and I have so many clients who trust me with their cases. So I'm not saying that that's, you know, pervasive throughout our community, but, you know, traditionally speaking, you know, back in the day, you know, Latina women were, you know, sort of expected to be homemakers and so, um, and even though I, I just want to be clear, if you are a stay at home mom or wife and that fulfills you, I believe, you know, yeah. I support you a hundred percent. I'm all about doing what it is that fulfills you. If being a career woman fulfills you, that's amazing. If being a stay at home mom fulfills you, that's amazing. I just don't like being told what we have to do. Okay. Right. That makes perfect sense. I want to talk about your love for a minute, but I have a, another quick question is, so with the young girls that you're you're providing mentorship with, what are some of those conversations like? Um, they're a lot of them are so different because some of these girls are still in undergrad. And so the conversations look like, how do you study for the LSAT? Do mm -hmm. I take an LSAT prep course? 
Um, other conversations are girls who already who are already in law school, and it's like, okay, well, how do I navigate um, negotiating a salary? How do I navigate um, finding a job? Mm-hmm. How do I navigate studying for the bar exam? So every conversation is different, but when because I've I've brought in a lot of guest speakers, like other attorneys in different legal fields, um, and you know one of the the recurring themes is like as you know Latina lawyers, because a lot of my my mentees are young Latinas, um, is like overcoming imposter syndrome. You right. know what I mean? Um, uh-huh. Hey know you got your your law degree you passed the bar exam there's no reason why you are not just as competent mm-hmm. as any other male lawyer out there you know what I mean and so a lot of it is like confidence building mm-hmm. um which I love um because you know I suffered from a lot of self-doubt and a lot of imposter syndrome when I was in law school and when I was a young lawyer um, you know, a lot of times I questioned whether I was smart enough to be an attorney yeah. or if I was smart enough to be self-employed. And mm-hmm. so if I can help other young, uh, other young women overcome imposter syndrome and really help build their confidence, well, then I feel, I feel really good about that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Okay. So now about your law firm, just tell us a little bit about your law firm. So, okay, great. So my law firm, I started it back in 2016 when I graduated from law school, um, I took the bar exam. Of course, it took several months to find out whether I passed the bar. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I found out if I, you know, that I passed the bar exam and I was, you know, so happy. And um, I knew right away that I wanted to be self-employed. And so, but I didn't know what area of law mm-hmm. I wanted to practice. Um, so I sort of dabbled in a lot of different things, criminal defense, family law, um, personal injury, business disputes. Uh, probate, a lot of different kinds of law. And the one that really stuck with me was, you know, plaintiff's work. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the reason why I love plaintiff's work is because um, one, the contingency fee uh, um, basis, which is, you know, we only get paid if we're able to secure a settlement for right. our client, because mm-hmm. I'm very bad at asking clients for money. Mm-hmm. So with criminal defense, family law, business disputes, mm. all that, you know, your clients have to pay your retainer and then they have to pay you hourly. And I was just never good at asking my clients for money. And it was just like not a good situation. And mm-hmm. I I find contingency fees um so much more suitable for me because it's like, okay, if I worked really hard on this yeah, case, right. uh-huh. then I get paid, right? Like and it, and I feel like it's fair all around. So I love I love the attorney fee structure for uh plaintiff work. Um and I also just loved uh the re- you know, it was so rewarding to be able, you know, it is so rewarding to be able to help people throughout, you know, a very difficult time in their life when they've been injured um through no fault of their own. And so, you know, it's it's very rewarding for me. And that's why I love, you know, doing what I do. I've been doing it for several years now. Um, we've recovered millions of dollars in settlements for our clients um in 2020 we recovered the largest settlement in the state of Texas for that year. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I just find it very rewarding and I love doing what I do. Yeah. So empathy. So I'm really big on empathy, meaning that um, I teach it a lot to my clients. So tell me about empathy. Um, I can tell that you're very empathetic. How do you, how do you teach that to your team and, and guide them to keep it consistent? Like, because, you know, their jobs, their careers that they're in, they're, they're difficult. They're not easy. I agree. Um, you know, we, we, I meet with all of my staff weekly, mm-hmm. every week we meet, we talk, we go over their docket, we go over what, you know, problem shooting, troubleshooting, what's going on. And, um, you know, I, I totally get that clients are difficult clients are really difficult to deal with because they're going through something really difficult. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I always, you know, try and remind them like, Hey, we're providing a service. Mm -hmm. If you put yourself in their shoes, you know, they're injured. Maybe they don't have a vehicle now because of, you know, they were in, say they were in a car accident. 
Now they don't have a vehicle. How are they going to take their kids to school? How are they going to get to work to make mm-hmm. money to provide for their families? Mm-hmm. Um, it's all about perspective and reminding yourself daily why it is you're doing what you're doing and, um, you know, trying to put yourself in their shoes. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been, I've been in car accidents, so I know what it's like. Most of my staff here, unfortunately have also been in car accidents. So we kind of all know what it's like to go through, um, you know, something like what we do, mm-hmm. um, really nothing, you know, traumatic or catastrophic. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do have clients who have been in catastrophic accidents, yeah. whether it's work accidents, mm-hmm. um, 18 wheeler accidents, mm-hmm premise liability accidents, um, very catastrophic, catastrophic injuries, even death. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I don't think it's that hard to be empathetic when you see very tragic sets of circumstances, but, you know, I get, we're doing this day in and day out and it can get repetitive. And so, you know, I'll tell them, okay, like take a step back, you know, take a quick break, breathe, um, and, you know, remember why, why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. So what about mental health? Um, how do you support or, um, promote self-care and, you know, mental health kind of watching it with your team and helping them to know the warning signs of, you know, things are just getting really, really bad. Um, what about that? Do you think about that at all? Do you talk about that with them? Do you mean the mental health of my team or of our clients? Team. The actual okay. team. Yeah. Um, you know, we that's something that I think I need to speak with them more often about. Um, but I think it's helpful that I meet with them weekly. And every time I meet with them, I ask them, like, hey, how are you doing? Are you happy here? Mm-hmm. What's the environment yeah. like for you here? Yeah. Are are you getting along with people? You know, I I I do ask them that. Is anybody yeah. picking on you? Is anybody bullying you? Yeah, bullying, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I do. I do ask those questions because that's something that I need to know, right? Um, and I always tell them, like, you can always come to me. Um, you know, if there's something going on in your life, please tell me about it so that I can help you move past it, right? You don't have to tell me details. Yeah. You don't have to tell me exactly what's going on, but if there's something going on in your life that's affecting that, if if you're bringing it to work, please give me a heads up so that I can know, okay, you know, so-and-so isn't performing at their best today, but at least I know why, or at least I know there's something going on that they're dealing with and I can show empathy towards them and give, you know, say like, Hey, maybe you should take the day off or take the afternoon off, whatever it is that you're going through. Um, but I do ask those questions. Are you happy here? Do you Mm -hmm. like it? Yeah. Right. Are you happy with the environment? Mm -hmm. Um, are you getting along with your colleagues? All I ask those questions a lot. Yeah, I think like another good way to do it um, is listening to call recordings. So do you listen to call recordings at your office? I do. Every single one of our phone calls is recorded. Right. So it's really good um, listening to prospect calls, obviously, because, you know, we're we're spending the money on the marketing. We want to make sure that we're doing the right thing by them and to help them and with the marketing dollars, but even client calls too, I think call recordings is the single best way to totally understand what's going on with your law firm. Just listening to the call, you can tell by how your team members sound, what they say, what they don't say. You can really have your finger on the pulse on a regular basis. And then when we let them listen to their calls, that's even more powerful because most of the time we don't even realize what we're saying or how we sound until we listen to it. And it's a good way to actually help because, um, you know, it's traumatizing for our team to handle these kind of calls, you know, day in, day out. Right. So that's something that would be really good. How many, how many um, intake specialists do you have, or how does that look at your firm? So there are seven of us. We have three case managers, one intake specialist, uh, one who is full-time marketing one who is full-time operations. Actually, we have several marketing, but some of them are, are contract employees. Um, and I have an office manager. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, the the girls we're, are actually all women here. Um, we oh, all, okay. all stay very busy. Yeah. That's, That's a good thing. It's like 
navigating an office of women only, it's like everybody needs to be, um, you know, I don't want to say positive, but have a positive outlook, attitude, communicate with me, you know, what's going on, because it's very easy for like toxicity to spread throughout an office. Yeah, 100%, 100%. So what else would you like everybody to know about you? Um, well, so one of, one of the things I'm most passionate about is rewriting the, um, society's definition of what lawyers look like, how lawyers should, um, appear and wear and, and, and act like, um, you know, I'm big on like being relatable, Mm -hmm. um, sympathetic, empathetic, not always, coming off as like a stern, serious, um, unrelatable lawyer, mm-hmm. because I think our clients, you know, they deserve to feel seen and heard by their lawyer. Right. And so, um, you know, I have been mistaken for staff before. Um, I've been mistake, you know, bailiffs have, you know, thought that I wasn't actually an attorney and that I was, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and wow. so, you know, I, I just think that society should, you know, question their own beliefs about what lawyers look like, what professionals look like, and, um, you know, marketing, you know, lawyers don't always have to be so stern and serious all the time. Show a personal side of yourself, you know what I mean? Show your clients, you know, who you are outside of the office and outside of the courtroom, Um, and really just humanizing the profession. I'm really passionate about that. So um, I'm very big on social media because Uh before I became a successful lawyer, I didn't have any money and I had to advertise myself through social media because it was free and that's all I had. Um, And so you can follow me at Crash Gal on Instagram and TikTok. Um, And Okay. So you do some TikTok? Do you? I love TikTok. Okay. (laughs) So um, my handle is the same on Instagram and TikTok. It's at Crash Gal. So um, feel free to send me a message and connect with me. um, And I'm happy to, to connect with you. Fantastic. Well, wonderful. All right. Well, I really appreciate your time. It's been great chatting with you. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. It's been it's been a pleasure. Absolutely. All right. So long, everybody. We'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to Lawyers Tell All, where Chris Mullins takes you on a journey with lawyers in the trenches who show you the realities of what it takes to succeed in this chaotic, crowded, ever-changing profession. Remember to visit our website at www.lawyerstellall.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on Lawyers Tell All. Thank you.